Well, welcome to the Raise Up Podcast, episode 18. 19. Ha ha. 19. You're right. It's episode 19. Mm-hmm. Do we, should we do it again? No. Okay. Just like that, be right one time. To... On <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the Raise Up Podcast. So I'm video. It's right episode now. Episode <laughs> 19. 19. And uh, I'm Athena and... Charlie. And we're your hosts today. And so if you have not yet, click subscribe on our YouTube channel. We want to hear from you and be able to share more content with you. So please do that. And I'd like to welcome our guests, Bill Fisher and Kimberly Fisher. So thank you guys for coming. Yeah, thanks Uh, for having us. We um, We are going to hear something very magical today. These are people that have been in our lives for decades and decades, and we've had the pleasure of coming alongside them in their entrepreneurial journey, and they've been there with us in our journey, and so we're gonna get some really good things today. And so, um, Charlie, you wanna take it away? Great, well, welcome guys. Thank you for showing up and having you guys here. And Thanks for you know, um, you know, when we met Bill, Bill is actually our Yellow Page, uh, he was our yellow page rep when we first met Bill. Oh, what kind of stories are we going to tell? <laughs> <laughs> Just talking about what our, how we met you. How it all started. How we met you. <laughs> you were great at the yellow pages. <laughs> so back in the day, that was there was no Google. It was that was how you got your business word out, and people opened up this big phone book. For those of you who've never seen one before. And um, we would pay monthly for these large page ads. Big money. <laughs> yes, Big hundreds money for of dollars. Uh-oh. But it was well worth it. And Bill the brought a value to us that um, was like our one of our main marketing pieces when we, we were in business. And so mm-hmm. you were a very important piece of our like revenue back then. If you didn't have the yellow pages, you were getting ready to go out of business. That's what we sold anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, a good that was the only way to. It was the only way to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and now, yellow pages are for fireplace. For the fireplace. <laughs> well, to boost their Athena had to and, explain what it was. So obviously, it's a dinosaur that. Yeah. No yeah, longer exists. They still show it, up once in a while. I don't know how that thing comes up on the door. I don't know who pays for it, but yeah, yeah. that's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. And then we introduced you to Kimberly. <laughs> Um, kind of, yeah. Sort of. Kind of like that. Yeah. Kind of like that. I knew, I met Kimberly prior and then found out that you knew her. And then I got the hookup. I was, I was, <laughs> gave you all good information. Yeah, it was really good information. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not going to talk about a lot of that. No, no. No, no we're not going to talk about that. No. But that's been, I know, how long have you guys been together? Married? 20. 23. And then how long did you guys date before that? 22 and married, or together 23, right? Okay. Yeah, I had to do math there for a minute. We met in like March of 01, and then we were married by June of 22. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, take it yep. back. So it gives you an idea of how long we've known them and been our best friends and good friends for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Lots of vacations, lots of things together. Mm-hmm. Lots of trials and tributes and victories and wins and a lot of good things going on there. Arguments and fights. Oh, and- amen. Yeah, it's part of a relationship. A lot of learning lessons, and it's all been good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, not I'd say business partners, but we do a lot of things and help each other out in different ways of helping our businesses and helping uh, grow them on both sides. So yeah, it's been Charlie, really Charlie and Athena were instrumental uh, when we started our food truck, uh, which is one of our businesses that we um, ran, and that's how we got our start into the restaurant industry. And... Um, I don't think we could have afforded to stay in business if it weren't for you. Your mechanics were taking us, I mean, picking us up on the way to jobs and fixing our truck. And we used your shop to... Thaw the truck out. (laughs) To wrap it, to fix it. We put hot water in it, though. That that lasts longer than cold water. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That was all the fun. But, you know, it was all that stuff of learning where we are to get where we are today, I really feel, that we just had to go through all those different chapters in our lives to get to the place that we're at now and uh, you guys are instrumental in helping with catering and helping us with our businesses and helping us with all the different things that we've gone through in our life too i mean it's just like there's not one person that did more than the other i think it was just a combined effort between all of us i mean because well, all of our you. partnerships with our friends and our other businesses and everything that we've had have really um 
I'd say really skyrocketed where we're at today. They're, they're, and your guys' friends, I mean, having Jared inside your guys' business and knowing the restaurant business and, you know, Kimberly working in the restaurant business for so long and knowing how to take care of the front of the house, you know, and just everything, it just seems like it's just like a, a big game of Jenga and we're just trying to figure out how we're going to get all the blocks well, lined up, you know? It's R&D, yeah. rip off and duplicate. Yeah. Well, so you learn from each other. There's nothing new under the sun, and there's always something that somebody else does that I you probably. I would say probably... borrow. Rip off seems like it's such a hard <laughs> name. Our, our borrow the ideas. Funnier. Every yeah. time I say it, people are like, "Yeah, I know what that is," and then I say, "Rip off and duplicate," and then they laugh like at the end. So, but yeah, I think that's. I, I absolutely think that um, you can't do anything alone. It takes a collection of people to come together, and uh, um, yeah, that's uh, kind of segues well into when we went through the pandemic and how our restaurant fared and we that's how we survived is we partnered with other businesses yeah you guys were i mean really took you guys from there because if you guys remember right you guys didn't really want to open uh an outside restaurant you guys just wanted to be pretty much a catering and then mm -hmm. you guys just were going to open it a few hours a day just to kind of keep the employees busy and everything like that and then look how it catapulted you guys i mean it yeah. just really did and, and i think covid for people like you guys did so well because the takeout orders and nobody really, you know, nobody was going out to eat. So the, the, the out, the takeout was just so huge for you guys. And it was just like, it blew you guys up and put you guys really on the map. Mm -hmm. And okay. I, I remember it, it, Clyde with the dish, I mean, or Silk, excuse me. I mean, same thing with happened to them. They weren't near as busy as they were until the pandemic happened. Then they were just so outgoing that I think for a lot of restaurants who were willing to make that change and do that parallel to be able to do the takeout and be able to be <laughs> reinvent their stuff a little bit, really did well with themselves. And when you had a ton of square footage in restaurants, uh, like some of these other places had that massive, you know, like Sullivan's and things like that, you know, it's a, it's a lot of takeout food to be able to make that numbers up. And they really uh, depend on their alcohol sales and things like that to really level them out. So yeah, there was no to go margaritas. In Alaska. No, <laughs> but you know, if you're in Texas, you could have a drive through and get it and you could just go yeah. and get a whole slushy cup full of alcohol and nobody mm -hmm. would really care, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, so. That's not here, but no. Yeah. That's, that's what we're saying. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's an interesting thing to say that, um, the pandemic really was helpful to build our business because a lot of businesses did not fare so well, but, uh, we feel very lucky. We just had put our chess pieces in the right location at the right time. Yeah. We had, um, Bill had signed us up for DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub in January. We opened in February without, without realizing there were, where we were going in 2020. And then having that happen, um, we did, we just had to pivot. And I remember, um, we he would drag a barbecue to the end of the street and we put picnic tables outside and we would sell a, a plate of barbecue food to people that were driving by and called it street street side barbecue and then we uh invited other vendors to come and set up pop-up tents outside and um people still come and ask if we're going to do street side barbecue again <laughs> and i'm like it's been a couple of years i don't think it's probably coming broke back. every rule <laughs> i don't COVID think we broke rules. no we were outside <laughs> but yeah it was it was an interesting time to be in business and I, I just, a friend of mine during that time, it was really scary, but he said, you know, there were businesses that were built during the, the depression. And I thought, gosh, that's, that's a really good mind shift. Instead of thinking, oh, why is this happening to us? Look at it as what is this going to create as an opportunity for us? And what can we do with that? Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Yeah, I, I say to people all the time that COVID really COVID made our business. Like, how did you survive through COVID? What? COVID made our business. You know, I mean, just all of the, we were going to be a high-end restaurant. That was my goal, was to sell a little bit of food to, for lunchtime, and then dinner time. we are going to be a high-end restaurant. And um, boy, our plans got foiled on that really fast, but I think for the better, because we're just we're more well-oiled to do what we're doing now. But there's no going back. We can't. No. Can't go back from it. And um, why would you guys? I mean, you guys really have built a, a great business and a good platform there for yourself. Thanks. I mean, to try to go from where you're at now to try to be a, a Sullivan's or a Yen's or something like that would just. It was through. passion at the time. Sure. It was like, you know, you want to do things that you, you love to do and you enjoy. Sure. I went to culinary school and I really loved that part of it to be super creative. Um, and you know, making cheeseburgers, you can only be so creative. 
So but you guys times, have been over creative with those. Over You've been yeah. the yeah, most over. creative <laughs> cheeseburger I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> the pictures on the menu are like amazing. Thanks. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. One of the things that I think is really significant, and I love telling this story because it just tells you all about Alaskans, and that is that um, when uh, when they would close us down for indoor dining, it was our children and us that would be in the restaurant just hoping that maybe somebody will order. And I did have one cook that stayed on and she would just hang out with us and then clock in when it was time to work. And um, people came into our restaurant and said, we did our research and we've, we've never eaten here before, but you're a mom and pop restaurant and we don't wanna give our money to the big restaurants that are that have lines and lines and lines of people Jeez. in the drive-thru, we want to give it to you. And uh, a couple of times w people would come up and go, here's a hundred dollars. We just want to see you stay open. That's awesome. Wow. Wasn't that cool? Yeah. Or they would buy a gift card or, and so I always say that. Uh, yeah, somebody bought a $250 gift card, like right after lockdown, first lockdown. And they said, I'll use it when it's over. I don't yeah. know if they ever used it. Yeah. They eat, they still eat with us. But, um, uh, yeah, it's just uh, it was just really cool because it to me it's a testament of what Alaskans are like. We wanted to see each other succeed, and we wanted to encourage that, and and um, and everybody sort of did really kind of try to help people stay alive. And that's where we started Fish Friday. My husband's from New York. I remember that. And he loves Fish Friday, big Chunk Catholic fish community like there. <laughs> yep. Yep. And so he was like, I want to do Fish Friday, but I don't want to use just any beer. I want to use some of these breweries that are struggling. So he went to all the breweries and we would um, partner with them. Uh, we didn't have a liquor license at the time. And so we would offer a coupon for somebody to come to our restaurant to eat dinner uh, using their beer in our batter, and then and then we were also promoting their businesses to go and pick up beer. So, you know, I remember partner. before that you guys were literally doing the food trucks in front of their breweries too. So you yeah. guys already had developed some of those relationships mm -hmm. with them because they didn't have the food part of it, and they had the alcohol part of it. So you guys were yin and yang. I mean, you guys were really partnering up with other ones here in town. So it really made sense for you guys to do something like that. I mean, it was really good, smart yeah, ideas. It was fun reaching out. And, yeah. And, and, partnering up with other businesses i think that was the best part of it was was that hey we're hurting you're hurting let's help each other let's work together yeah. <laughs> let's make this let's make let's this help each thing. other yeah and, and what we have going for us is everybody's miserable so they need a drink and some really good food so <laughs> well you know and i remember talking to k and l and a couple of their the beer places and they were really worried about how their sales were going to do and you talk about a place that just skyrocketed in their numbers. I mean, their numbers went up 100, 200, 300 percent. Yeah, people. Because alcohol sales and everything else were just skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. I mean, not was, much else to do. Well, you know, there was, you know, with having the lockdown and everything mm -hmm. else like that. It was kind of scary know. times. And I can imagine when people um, are afraid, they, they go to things that make them feel comfortable. And, sure. Um, food garlic, and alcohol. Garlic fries <laughs> yeah. and cheeseburgers are comfort food. Yeah. So it, um, that's part of the reason why I think we did as well as we did, because our food is comfort. And you guys are still on the map now. I mean, there's not many people that don't know your restaurant. And now that you yeah. guys have a second location downtown, um, down over in the... Uh... It's funny. We, we we still have people all the time. You have a restaurant? What's it called? Where? Oh, I've never heard of that. They hear that all the time. All the time. <laughs> and, but just, yeah, but yeah we, there's a market. That's we all. did open a second location right next to the Bass Pro Shop. Um, that used to be the old Craner's Diner, correct? Craner's Burgers and Pies. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Related to this Craner's Diner. It was yeah. their son's business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a great location there too. I mean, that, that serves a whole different part of town that you guys are not, you know, not accustomed to on this side of town. So you don't get as many people to come over from that side over here. So that was a really good pivot move for you guys. Yeah. We were blessed. We were, it was, it was a huge blessing to walk right into a turnkey operation. And it was just like, it was God given because the business is in the black and you know that's all we right can away really, it was because yeah. we went from being it was a burger restaurant to we're a burger restaurant so it was an easy transition and it's going to celebrate it's one year from opening on the 31st i remember that the mayor was there and we were at your grand opening and yeah, the yeah. ribbon cutting, the ribbon cutting. The that was really yeah that was cool yeah it's a it's a good business and we're actually looking at our third business right now um, location, yeah. Possibly we're in the, in communication with it. Hopefully we find out in the next week or two we'll have a third location and it'll be downtown. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now do you have someone in mind to be like running that that restaurant too? Or um... Yeah, we really like to promote within. 
And uh, what happened with the second location is um, we had an employee that started out working for us during COVID, worked his way up all the way through the ranks and was my, my right-hand man, general manager of our South location. And he was thinking, I like what you guys do and I'd like to further be a partner with this. And if you wanted to open another location, I'm in. And so he did. He came to the table with money and we said, you know, we want to wait until we find the right space. We looked at a lot of spaces and then this one came up and it worked out really well. So he actually is the operations general manager owner of that location. I handle the um, paperwork side of things and Bill handles the marketing and sales and together we make a really good team. So it's a, um, I really like that part of the business. It's, it's so beautiful to, to, I don't have I, to go in and watch I think dishes. I go there once a month because he's, <laughs> hey Bill, uh, my pilot's out and I can't figure out how to turn it on so yeah. I have to go over there and help him but uh, it's I, I don't go in I don't yeah or the, the, it's the model I mean the, words the franchise the... is it, I'm just seeing the lights you know it you know and that's sense. good for you guys because sometimes you don't find the right partner I mean yeah um, it's tough to find another person that has the same business mind like that you guys do that you guys can work with that is not against the grade I mean they're really going with it and you guys are all kind of working together yeah. so I mean that Especially makes a they... huge difference Especially when they've kind of worked through the whole and they understand it all and they've worked through the yep. ranks. And I just, my philosophy is life is good for us and so we want to make it good for people around us. And I want my employees to come with me. I want them to, I want to raise them up. We, ha I love the name of your podcast um, and, uh, um, and your core values because I, I totally believe that. We have something we call Empower Hour where we're trying to teach our employees how to do what we do and how to be good at it. And, it, and it's cool to see the ones that are like, I think I wanna be a part of this too. And I see a vision and I, I wanna come with you. And we're teaching them how to be our competitor, literally teaching them, telling them, if you ever leave here and start your own business, I want you to do better than what we're doing. And I want you to understand the books. I want you to understand everything that happens behind the scenes, all of that stuff. It's not just about a customer coming in and ordering a cheeseburger or whatever the case. There's so much involved. And um, we tell them that if you ever leave here and you become a competitor, we want you to be successful. So the reason is because if they stay with us, they know exactly how the business is supposed to be ran. They and then know, we'll be successful. And then we'll be successful. So it's just, yeah. You guys are successful. So. Well, well you guys are. Yeah. Not like you're successful. No, no. <laughs> so One day. What, Differently. <laughs> what led you to that mindset? Because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are going to see this podcast and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't tell them that. Like, yeah. then they're going to take my, my secrets and go like, leave me and I will have nothing. And it's like this scarcity mindset of I've got to hold it all in. So at what point did you come to like was there a particular event that happened or you had this epiphany or you well, went to a class like we've been doing mentorships and we've been spending a lot of money we would never do men mentorships never pay somebody to masterminds tell us how to do and masterminds and whatever and, and this last yeah. year we've spent like forty five thousand dollars on mentorships masterminds all that good stuff programs and it's just but it's paying off in dividends but um uh, who was it that said uh what do you say? If what if I train my employees and spend all this money on them and then they leave, and then somebody says, "But what if? What if you don't? You know, it's, you're basically you're keeping a hindrance if you don't train that employee to be the best possible employee that they ever could be." But I think it was the mentorships, and um, one of the smartest things that I've heard recently was. Uh, if you're if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room, and it pays to be the dumbest guy in the room. So you should constantly be learning, and that's what we've been doing. We've been reading a lot of books. We've been, I mean, we we share books constantly, auto audio books, and um, and uh, so I don't know. I think a lot of a lot of the learning that we've been doing, but we're part of a restaurant mentorship, and I think it just. It just clicked one day because someone was saying we're, we're with like 40 other restaurant owners and someone was saying it, how they're they're not training their employees and and they're constantly moving them around or whatever the case or losing them and i was thinking well why don't we wouldn't it make sense if we just train them to be our competitors 
Wouldn't it make sense to train them to learn how to run the business the way we would want it ran? Because if they stay, then it makes sense. They're going to be incredibly valuable. Yeah. Um, not everyone's going to stay and you know people come and go and it always makes me sad when we lose a really valuable person for our team but I really want to make sure that they're better than they were when they started like they're leaving having gained knowledge and wisdom and and I, I think that in itself is just worth it um, yeah and I think that's something we learned from I think it was you with you I'm not sure um, but I remember back at your other place when you had goat on the wall. I think it was goat. Yeah. And and you explained it to me one day that your your vision is not just to make people better, um, but to, to pull out the best in them, I think is what you something along the lines of that. And and that just sat with me. Because um, we're not just dealing with line cooks, you know, you're dealing with human beings. You're dealing with people who want to also be successful. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of business owners might want to keep their guys down. Like, no, oh, you're never, you're never going to succeed past this. We want you to stay here. What I want to do is I want to teach them how to be general managers and owners. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome if if they stayed with me for ten years? Yeah, we could and, have fifteen main events. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, that's really the key. I was just going over, uh, there's, a, there's a few positions that report directly to me. Mostly it's the directors or the, the department managers, but I really believe that I've got three solid areas that I focus on, and one is the culture, one is our finance, and then the other one is um, really, it's, it's this um, piece of supporting the leadership team. And so if I'm doing those three things and I'm helping the leadership team get to where they need to be or to um, remove barriers or bottlenecks or whatever, uh, and I've got a pulse on ARs and APs with our reporting tools or, or, or our human connections, then, um, then the culture piece is just reinforcing the raise up and the goat goals. Uh, but the accounting team does report to me directly as a result of finances being a hyper focus of mine. And I was explaining a little tool that I use called our month at a glance because I have a new accounts payable person. And, and I was explaining to him that you have your momentum log through the month is days one through 31, but then there's this month at a glance and the stuff that you're doing every single day, it's on the daily, there's, there's stuff you're gonna do every week, you pull that from the, th the 31 day list and you start building yourself this, this is what my average month looks like. I go, but then the goal is, once you establish what that month at a glance is, then we start writing processes around the stuff that you're doing for your role because this may not be where you end up. If you love it and this is where you wanna stay, some positions have caps, but that, that's okay. But if you're looking to move on, we need to teach the person behind that is coming up behind you how mm -hmm. to do this. And so um, that was like my first main meeting with that individual was to reassure them that this isn't just you writing down the tasks that you're doing because I need to know that you're on track. It's you need to have a follow-up tool, but then there's this bigger picture of maybe there's a different position that's raising up within the organization or the organizations we have several that we own mm -hmm. and so there's just just this this idea on the very first day of of understanding and it's good i feel like that is like the essence of what raise up is it's to raise up ourselves our community and the team around us and mm -hmm. our community isn't just alaska it's not just our our mastermind groups, it's like every human that we touch in the world. Somebody could be in Austria watching our podcast. That's a, that's a part of the community that we're bringing into us. And so it's awesome. But yeah, I, I totally believe that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. What do you think the biggest part of your success is? I would say, number one, it's not luck. It's, it's, Oh, it's definitely not luck. It's full on intentionality and having this like vision for 
where you see things coming. I mean, it's, I think as we go through our business, we've, we can only see this part of the picture, but then, you know, like you guys saw food trucking, but then you saw, well, it's like the, the spotlight started to get bigger. Yep. And then you went and then it came here. And so I think it's, it's a part of being intentional, hard work, but then it's also staying open. Mm -hmm. I think it's looking for the opportunities too. Mm -hmm. I think there's parallels to your businesses that you have that you can work off of. Um, I'll take one of our phrases is is the airport. I mean, um, I remember getting the first contract for the airport with World Airways and I happened to be up at three o'clock in the morning because I was sick and I took a phone call. It's back before we had a 24 hour service that answered our our phone calls. We didn't have a 24 hour dispatch. You were it. And I was it, two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning. Somebody called me from Florida about nine months from now at four in the morning because it's eight their time and they want to know how much the cruise is going to cost to get picked up, you know, six months from now. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. looking through our paper sheets, trying to see if there's any booked at that time, you know, but um, taking that phone call with World Airways, I mean, really changed our outlook on how to do crew transportation. And mm-hmm. now we maintain 95% of all the crew and the anchorage. And, and by taking that on and showing other crews and other people who can do it and then working with the airport, um, and I'm talking about the parallels, is getting into wheelchair service, getting into baggage claim delivery, mm-hmm. working with the other airports, getting into airline diverts. I mean, <clears throat> all those things were parallels because we started doing crew transportation and that was the opportunity. And much like yourselves doing the, I mean, you guys used to do some catering before you guys even, it used to help you with food before you guys even started your catering well, business back in the day, you know? So, so when we got married 23, 22 years ago? I think you guys have agreed it was The 22. caterer no-showed to our wedding. That's how we started catering. Yeah. From that point on, I started making uh, wedding cakes and helping people with Best their weddings. Best cakes in the world. I wish you'd go back. There. I don't, I don't <laughs> remember that. Yeah. So the person that was supposed to do the food no-showed. And uh, what, Were you in one of the CPC Yeah, you were one of the people in with the... With 500 cupcakes? No, that no, was No, no that but was we're Jerry, talking but... about your wedding. Your wedding. Like, no, yeah. not, the, not I, the cupcakes itself. Like, no. So the, the wedding party, you were in the wedding party. I know. That's you guys were cooking the food. That. Yeah, you were cooking the food. That's why. You don't remember because so. we gave everybody a bottle of Crown who was in the wedding. <laughs> and that said, finish be. this that before be we why. get there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we showed up because we did a two-hour limo ride before we came to the reception. And there was everybody with their so sleeves rolled up in the kitchen making food. I was, And I was like... What what happened anyway? So yeah, you guys just made it happen, and that was pretty cool. So that was the beginning of uh, catering, and then in 2016 in January, because my name had just been passed along to people, and I even I dropped off a wedding cake. Um, I never met the bride or groom, and it was just a by word of mouth. Somebody said, "Well, she makes wedding cakes." Um, I did this wedding for 350 people, and Bill looked at me and he goes, "Why are you not getting paid for this?" And I was like, I don't know. Why are we not getting <laughs> well, I was like, I don't, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I just do it for a hobby. And he, and that began the starting of the discussion of we should start a business. And, and it's kind of like what you were talking about. So I, I like what you were talking about. It was like to take off the blinders, you know, like sure. a horse running a race has those blinders so they don't see what's to the left and what's to the right. So they can just focus on what's right in front of them to finish that one job. And um, you're saying to open the horizons and start looking at many different things. But what would you say to somebody like me who's got business ADD and um, can't seem to keep the eye on the prize? I mean, I'm constantly like, oh, look at this now. Oh, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go build a podcast studio. I call I'm gonna go- him a serial entrepreneur because... Right. He's doing a lot of different things. But you know, that that's not a bad thing because it's the one there. Athena used to say that stuff about me too. It's like I would always looking at different opportunities as our mobile ad truck business, you know, things that we did in the various that we really thought were great ideas. But if you look at all the greats, if you look at all the people that were successful businesses, I mean, they had bankruptcies, they had all kinds of different things mm-hmm. that happened in their lives because they weren't scared to try something. And that's, that's the difference of the that's what of the I always things. say to her. And, and, and there's there's got to be there's got to be small jumps and there's got to be leaps and you got to figure out where those jumps and leaps are um, and you have to look at it and saying hey does this really make sense or not I mean my fire truck business I mean that was more of a hobby for me and it was my there, my, there was for no me by convincing it. me that it was anything other than a hobby today. but you know what the same thing on the motor coaches she didn't want me to buy motor coaches at the time and then we have eight of them and now they are successful so they're same things that we would not agree upon a hundred percent because I saw a vision she didn't or she saw a vision I didn't. But usually, 
it, we we steered in the right direction. And how do you um, guys do that? How how so are you I, successful? About I can that? explain that yeah, in a different sure. way. So <laughs> anytime <laughs> that you are in a leadership role, it becomes clear to you the things that you don't love, the things that you struggle in. If you're honest with yourself, like mm -hmm. you know whether or not you like to answer emails, you know if you're a phone person or not a phone Hate person. It. Hate it all. And so the the idea here then is to start surrounding yourself with people or team members that fill in those gaps for you. Higher your weaknesses. And that, um, in, or your strengths too. It, in an essence, yeah. yes, because the idea here is that you're moving yourself to a place to where you can only do the things that you can do and that you want to do. Want to do is the, the kick, not just what you have to do, is what you want to do. The passion. Yes. So yeah. like for instance, Charlie and I are the only ones that can host the Raise Up podcast because we are the hosts of the Raise Up podcast. This wouldn't be something that we would delegate out to one of the team members because we're the, the titled hosts. We're the How, talent. However, <laughs> and now we brought the other talent. <laughs> the the we don't have to do the lighting. We don't have to do the sound. We don't have to clean the um, the room. We don't do we don't do those things. But we come and show up and do what we're here to do, and that's probably the bigger picture here. Is um, there are there are seasons and times in our lives where I think we didn't fully understand how much of a scarcity mindset that we were in. And part of that, I think, was contributed to having debt when we were younger. That very much um, like created that momentum of we don't have enough, we have to do this, we have to do yeah. that. And so therefore there was this like pull in, keep it close, we need to put money towards this, like don't invest in that idea. And now in this season where debt is not an issue, there's more of a free flow of creativity that didn't exist before because the goal was to get out of debt or not create a larger debt on top of the pile of debt that we already had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably a, one of the changes that happened, but him and I are so very different yeah. in the way that we organize ideas uh, and those are strengths even though they sometimes have caused like um, interesting conversations between us. It's uh, his, one of his superpowers is connecting with people through communication, like on the phone, on Facebook. Like I don't ever have to create any content for our Facebook stuff because the marketing team can go on his Facebook page and pull every single thing that we've been up to lately. Hmm. And I don't have to funnel them any pictures because that's a power that he has having all of these phone calls that he's in touch with all of these humans and all of these business connections where he's genuinely calling you and saying, hi, how are you? And like, who does that? Just to but like I, call. Yeah, I know that you guys are definitely polar opposites and so are we, but what I'm saying is like the vision thing and the reason I'm asking that question is because like Kimberly and I are completely different. I was for forever the, the one who had vision where she was, the place where dreams come to die, and and that's where that's what we used to call it. Because I was like, "Hey, I got this great idea. How are you going to pay for that?" <laughs> well, so but now she's starting to get the bug, and she's really start. Her vision is just opening, and she's like, "During COVID, we I think we should I think we should open five restaurants this year." And I'm like, "Whoa, hold on, hold on, that's a little much." But so like, visions don't always line up, and how do you decide to choose like the main vision this is where we're both heading you know but you have this idea i have this idea how do you choose which ones to go with well i mean i i think that you have to look at the plan and what what, what the vision is going to be it's like you know the one thing that we're moving towards now is more real estate so and i think you guys are on the same mm -hmm. vision quest that we are um, you know, one of the things that we like to, and Athena uh, touched on it, is the debt free. I mean, we own almost everything outright. We don't owe any money to anybody. And, you know, um, I don't know if it's that darn class that you guys, I took because Athena asked me to go to uh, Dave Ramsey. The Dave Ramsey thing. And, you know, it's, some of that sunk in. Like, a lot of it is like, cut your credit cards. I'm like, this guy's crazy. We yeah. cut our credit cards up. I mean, I got miles. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I look at that now. We never have any credit card debt. We, 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 we 
we charge off our credit cards every month. Like last month, we got over 200,000 miles in the airline miles because we put our diverts on them and things like this. We use them as a tool, as a tool to, to, to elevate ourselves up and our businesses up to pay for things because we pay it right afterwards anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and so as she was saying that, you know, not having debt, not having car payments, not having the vehicles, all of our vehicles we own outright, everything new, the only debt we really have is this building, um, is it? And and, uh, and we're still paying off some ERC loans that we didn't know that we were gonna, you know, need them if we didn't need them or anything like that. Those are low interest rates, but housing is the only really debt we have. And um, that just lifts that elephant off your chest. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the whole thing. And, um, you know, and there is some homes that we, we don't own outright. There's a few of them that we, we still have payments on, but they're so low interest rates, like 2%. It doesn't really make sense on it too, but, um, it, it allows Looking creativity at these, and, and yeah. you don't have as much fear to try new things. Because... And, that, and that's the whole thing is we that don't have sense. we don't have that stress under it. Like, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, I, I still watch the accounts all the time and I see where it is and where money gets put in the wrong places or things like this. And I see it because I I'm always constantly in my head. What do we have in there and what's going on with that? And what do we look like? But on the other hand, that there's not a time that either of us buy anything for the most part, any time that we have to worry about the, the cash flow. I mean, we purchased a new boat this year and I asked the thing about that because it was, a, it was a big purchase for it, but it was one of those things that we just don't have that, that anxiety about it. And we have good cash flow coming in. So we always know there's good cash flow coming in and it is keeping this, this is our baby. I mean, BAC has been our baby from it, uh, from where it's been, you know, I mean, in 20 plus years, right? Yes. 24 years now. Yeah. And then, you know, Athena was a major part of that whole thing when we were doing it because, you know, CNG services did fairly well. Okay, you know, back in the day, we were making a million and a half a year, you know, gross. But when we lost some of our big contracts, Athena's like, you know, we're always racing ourselves to the bottom. And that's one of the things I always looked at is every bid I put out was always usually to the lowest bid or it was really close to the, the lower bid. Nobody was saying, hey, I'm, I want this top service here for snow plowing. They, mm -hmm. they wanted to get where they were paying the lean. Clear the like, snow. Get rid but, of yeah, it. and yeah. you know when I lost Frampton Opinski, that was a huge contract for us because we had a lot of properties and had a lot of equipment invested into that. And she's like, you know, there's only a few people doing the at the time it was the limousine business. It was what we started off as. Yeah, I think there was like two main competitors, and they weren't big. Yeah, Gomer and Aurora, I think were our two biggest ones at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Luxury and uh, Aurora. And I know those those guys weren't going to go very far with it because they were in a small mindset mind. They they didn't see the bigger picture of what mm -hmm. it was. So we were very uh, uh, we were very good to be able to pick that up and then really take off with it. And uh, and then the airport contracts and everything else that just came along with it. And and we still get calls today just because of the airport things. I mean, uh, and I always bring the story up because like remember when the air, the air the airport called us up and said, hey, would you guys like to start? parking planes. I'm like, well, we don't want any tugs. I don't want to park an airplane. She's like, well, you don't have to park them. You just have to tell them where they have to park at. Hmm. But it was because of our relationship at the airport and they saw how things turned around for us there and how we turned around for them that, you know, it was like Mikey, you know, he, he'll, he'll eat anything, you know, let, let take it, you know, how can you do it? So then we started picking and choosing kind of the, some of the things that really stayed in our lane. And one thing that Athena and I really kind of stuck with is like, you know, transportation is our lane. That, that's where we should kind of stay into at mm -hmm. that time don't veer far off from it. So like when we were bidding for the contract for the airport for doing the um, the carts, for the luggage carts, I mean, you know, that was a that was a piece of business that we felt was in our lane because it was transporting bags. And we already do that for the airlines. We, we transport bags. So this made sense to us. So I mean, then we, we put in a bid for it and we lost it, of course, you know, I mean, Skycart. Well, well, we weren't awarded it. We never Smart had it. So no, we didn't, we didn't lose it. it. Yeah. We um, lost the bid, but, but we I didn't think get that's it. the piece is that you you pick Stay a lane, lane, and it can be a three lane, it can be a one lane, but you're like picking this lane, and ours was transportation. And when he would call me, he would have all of these different ideas, and sometimes he would buy stuff to like support that idea. But at the end of it, uh, if I knew that if I didn't support him with like paper pushing and structure that it wouldn't actually come to fruition. So it wasn't like I had to, um, like I had, like I would wait and see how much energy and enthusiasm he had around an idea. And if it was like really flaming up and it was a transportation like mode of some kind, then that's kind of where we, we went. But at that time earlier in the business, he was the one that had this vision of like where revenue was going to come from. And I kind of like kept my nose in the books and hung out with the humans that worked with us 
whereas he had these visions of this this relationship and he was the one that was going to the meetings and and um you know just rubbing elbows with people where that wasn't really my thing and in that season I had small children at home and there was a lot of um, like working from home stuff going on so mm -hmm. but really that's it is that I would look and see how much of this um, he's really like like I remember one day he called me and said you're not gonna believe this but I got a shoe shining like yeah. Kiosk. <laughs> and I did the same thing that you guys are doing right now. I just started laughing. It's like, it'll be great. But an auction for like 500 bucks. We're gonna I think I remember that. I do. We're going to set it up downstairs in the airport and, and the shoe shine you know is going to be marketing. You know what made me think of it, Bill, is when you and I and Adam and those guys went to go get that shoe shine. Yep. And that guy was shoe shining. He started shoe shining Adam's socks because he was watching somebody go by. I'm like, hey, dude. You're, you're shining his socks. He's like, hey, shut the fuck up or something like that. <laughs> he's like, he's like, mind your own business. I'm like, we're all together here. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, so like, and I was like, dude, my socks like this. But, you know, I mean, I looked at that. And I'm like, wow, this is not a bad thing. I mean, this is a cash revenue business. It's always there. Because if you go back to my ice cream trucks, I mean, everybody thought I was crazy in my ice cream trucks when you were making 200% margins. I'm like, it was not crazy whatsoever. I mean, it was really, it was a, it was a solid base cash revenue business per day. And it was super easy. I mean, in fact, the permitting was so much more lax than it is today. But I mean, you look at these different things and you look at numbers and, you know, I always think back that uh, that movie with Bugsy and stuff like that. And they went to that little small town and there's this little bar there and this lady's like, I can't believe you own this dump. And the guy's like, this is cash revenues every month. It makes like five or 10,000 a month. And she talked Bugsy into knocking it down, and, and they said, "What were you thinking? It was it was cash revenue. It was making money. It was a it was a system that you didn't have to put a time or energy in." And there's so many of those that you can do. But now I look at we are versing time for money, money for time. So how much more time do we want to put in to make how much more money, and how much money do we need for the time that we're left? So mm -hmm. there's a balance act of that um, that you look at. So I mean. We still come up with ideas and as pivoting, like I said, we're doing real estate STRs now and you guys are doing the same thing. I mean, you guys got into the STRs before we did and you guys started STR in your house and now you're buying properties. Now you guys got a property in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, I think that is a lot of what we're looking to is moving into pivoting is uh, taking some of the resources and money from here. We're still reinvesting in the BAC and Alaska Medical Transport, but we look at that and say, how can we do this as more long-term and what is an easier path? When I see easier is, is it less employees, less people that we have to, to maintain and manage? Yeah. Maybe not as high profit margins, but good money that's gonna come down the line that's gonna be supportive for our retirement at one day, whatever that is, you know? What, what does that look like, you know? Mm -hmm. And if we own all these houses outright, and then we have, you know, 40, 50,000 a month coming in, what's that look like, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. where, where do we stand? So that is, uh, one of the things. So Bill, I, I hope it's answered some of your questions, but keep having those visions because the visions are what people do and there's lack of them sometimes. And, and you just have to get your partner and, 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 and really agree upon trying something or looking at it or what does that look like and, or dive more into it and see what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. I think without the visions that we all had, I mean, the ambulance service, I mean, how pivotal as you guys were taking, we started that in 2019 and really took off in 2020, then COVID came up and we were doing 14 transfers a day with COVID patients, you know, and it was yeah. just it really took off the board when we were running no EMS and they were just really a box in a van and taking people from point A to point B because it was separating the COVID patients from the other people. Yeah. So it was just, you know, things happen and never luck. I think timing is everything. <clears throat> I think timing in your guys' marriage and relationship happened because of the time it happened. If it would have happened nine months ago or a year before that, it probably wouldn't have happened because it wasn't the right timing in some mm -hmm. things. And I think timing is everything. I mean, you really Proper systems to. in the timing. Yeah. I mean, everything's got to be really aligned because some people are married, some people are not. Some are in relationships or not. It's when those times happen that they come into. The same thing I, I, I say with our baggage claim contract that we had, they were so irritated with the country that they were using before that they had this breaking point and said, hey, do you guys want to take this over? Well, if we weren't already doing their other things with them and meet with them meetings for every week, we probably wouldn't have been an option for it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's luck. I think timing is everything. I don't think oh. there's anything luck about what you guys do. We've watched you guys grind and grind. Athena, from when you had your housekeeping business, and at the same time, then running the admin side of Bach, and, and uh, we've watched you guys work 24-hour business and just 
I, I remember saying many, many times, I do not want a business I remember, like that. Yeah, I remember I, you saying I that. I never want to have a 24 hour business. Never want your problems, Charlie. <laughs> no, no, now I want to have a life. Have. And, and now you finally, guys, you, 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 you persevered, you pushed through, and you did the grind, mm -hmm. and now you're able to go away for a month or have that time or whatever the case, or, or you're not having to be the one to push the buttons. And well, that is what you said a moment ago. That's about systems. That's yeah. about having a pathway so that people understand what the expectation is, what's the underlining underneath that. Like we have these, uh, we have these set of SOPs, not because I just want you to do 15 tasks today. It's because when you do this, it keeps this from happening. And when you do this, it helps support this team member and, and it's just so on. So that's really the key. And you guys are on track to be creating all of these powerful mm -hmm. systems. And some of them you already have. And so you're seeing that for yourself. Yeah, we definitely. Well, once you start to realize that, well, um, for me, it was uh, I did all the cooking. I was the one that was making all the burgers, but I couldn't manage the restaurant or pay bills or handle all the details if I was the one that was doing the cooking. So I had to hire people to do that. And then when I hired people to do it, then I had to make sure they were doing it correctly. And then there needed to be a team to support them so they could do their job. And yeah, and that's where all that SOP stuff comes into play. Yeah, and it's, it's effective it does. communicating. Absolutely. I, I think, think that sorry. that's okay. But I think the reason why anybody, you guys keep saying luck, luck, luck. It's not luck. And I agree. And I think that um, sometimes people get a snapshot of where you're at today, but they don't get to see where we started oh, no. from. And um, they the the really the key factor is keep working keep going yeah don't give up people give up too soon and then and that's why I've... they want it to happen instantaneously they want to they want to go from where we were 24 years ago to where we are now and they yeah. want to do that in a year and when they don't see the progress and they don't see the things and when things sometimes get tough they 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 look at their out. day two and they look at your day five thousand yeah and try and figure out why they're not where you're at. Mm -hmm. but, some people do that yeah but then other people they see something and then they join a mentor program that helps them go further faster mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's another piece too is it's getting yourself around individuals that mm -hmm. can ins keep you inspired keep you energized that give you those shortcuts because mm -hmm. that has been a critical point of our success is investing in the education and committing to the communities that we've joined over the years and I would the agree. umpteen hundred books that i've read mm -hmm. around culture and leadership like it's really deciding that this is going to be your craft and owning your craft mm -hmm. But, you know, and working with some of our partners, like Alaska Airlines taught us so much, FedEx taught us so much, all these different airlines and the people that already have systems and, uh, set up that are in there. And then you listen to how they're doing things and uh, you just like, wow, you know, I mean, they have it down pat. They have these things down pat every day of when their flights are coming and how many to do, what's our what's our weak points, what we can do. So we, we took a lot of those things, as Kimberly would say, what's your, what's your acronym for that? The R and D, yeah, R and yeah. D, yeah. rip you know, off and duplicate, rip off and duplicate. I mean, we look at that, and we even tell those guys, you know, hey, sometimes we've just learned so much from you guys. Thank you for the education you give us because we're partners, and we want to learn it the way they do it because we want to run our business the same way we run it for them because they're one of our largest partners, you know. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure we're doing the things that they like because if we're we're in line with them, they're more in line with us, and then we end up getting more work for them. So, but absolutely. the thing is, is that they had to have an open door for us to start learning some of their process. So they like would invite us to their 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 operations meetings, their daily operations. They wanted to, us to know that this is the KPIs that they look at. This is how we play a role into the KPIs, and um, and be able to like check in with us face to face. Hey, what's your staffing look like today? Yeah. And so that is another example of a larger organization that didn't have this like scarcity mindset around raising up their vendors mm -hmm. they want to hire local <clears throat> we went to them so often that i could look at their board and i could figure out some of their board and i remember they're like where are we going to park this airplane i'm like well if you take c7 you move it over to c9 there's back you can put this one up there and they all looked around and they're like how do you know that i'm like well i've only been going to your meetings for three years now <laughs> I mean, yeah. i'm looking at this this is this is yeah. easy for me to read you know this is because we do the same thing at our office and so they switched things around he laughed and Wes came over and pat me on the shoulder and said wow charlie thanks you know and but partnering with them and, and learning their systems and just you know learning how like you, you can use those mm -hmm. yeah so learn from each other and you guys know 
getting into the real estate. I mean, how's that going for you guys? I mean, that, wait, wait, is that what? You, I mean, you guys are excited about that? I mean, oh yeah, of course. I'm excited about it. That's yeah, for sure. I, I'm I'm scaring the shit out of her. That's for sure because <laughs> of the purchases and, and moving forward I and doing all this. I haven't heard any um, <clears throat> feedback that she's afraid. So that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So I think maybe that is a limiting belief that you have, Bill. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe no. she maybe she limits my belief when we have other <laughs> conversations. <laughs> but well, like the other day, I I went and spent a big chunk of our savings on um, this property and some other purchases, and and I've also got into real estate lending. So I'm, it, it's called Gator lending, um, where I'm lending to as a private money partner on a lot of properties or investor. And um, we're making anywhere from 10 to 30% returns on the money, but it's high risk. And yeah. so um, I think it's cringy for her. It's cringy for me, so I know it's got to be cringy for her. But the other day I spent a gobble money on something and then it really brought down our savings. And in that, you always say... I, I, have, um, I, I was born with this extra organ in my body. It's called a security gland. And I like to have money in savings so that we, uh, it, for just in case. And the and other yeah. day, I ripped the Band-Aid off of that. <laughs> and, and I was I, like... And we were uh, fighting. <laughs> no, not fighting. But I was just like, I, I, I need Wasn't... you to see that you have a vision that you want to get to this place. And, and I I'm, I'm applaud that vision. But it cannot be at the cost of my security. <laughs> but you know that that's what makes you guys unique too i mean if bill if you had an open checkbook where would you guys be at and if you could just go anywhere mm -hmm. and do anything you wanted to and bro i say that i say thing with kimberly if she if she was there she would have the most abundant savings and it would be there and then she would yeah. just do take smaller risk where you guys were you guys are now taking big risks. I'd, I mean, the I'd probably still be in the food guys. truck if it was it wasn't for Bill. He definitely what? has. I'd still be in the food truck if it wasn't for you. Or we would never have the food. Or we would never have the food truck. Yeah. Um, actually, what I always say, and I said it in our, we did, we renewed our vows, and I said that I keep his feet firmly six feet off the ground. I think the podcast that I'm going to be doing is so I grew up very poor, and I think most of us in this room were probably always did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I grew up really poor. Government and I cheese. Yeah, I remember. It's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. Is I remember going through the government cheese line. I remember getting the dry milk and the cereal and all of that stuff. And uh, we were so poor. My, my mom would make pancakes for like a, a week. And we would eat pancakes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. And this is the reason why I don't like leftovers is because... I just she burned me on it, and uh, to the point where you know it just that bologna is not poverty. bad. Just put more mustard on it, kind of thing. To, <laughs> to green is the color it's supposed to be on the third week. <laughs> yeah. No, I thought the 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 ring around the bologna was red, not green. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But so I went back to New York for a wedding, and I noticed that um, a lot of people there are still in the same mindset and mentality that you have to be the same rat looking for the same piece of cheese and going to the same lines to get government subsistence and to uh, that they never were taught or told poor a is a choice. Success is a choice. Wealth is a choice. It's a hard choice. But, but it's it, all hard. But it's but it, yeah, if you want to be poor, it's going to be hard. It's if you want to be wealthy, it's going to be hard. But that's what I want to do is I actually want to teach young people that success and wealth is a decision in your life and you really just have to make the choice on it. Yeah, you mm -hmm. just you make a series of decisions and a, then a that, lot of series, that yeah. will propel you towards that's right. not for everybody guys i mean we we have to understand that there is people that want to be in that we're position. learning that yeah yeah and then yeah. you know I, sure. I i take i take uh i take liz and eric you know i mean i remember every weekend they were gone from thursday to sunday out camping and doing all this stuff and we were always in our 24-hour businesses and we were trying to catch up to them and they're like oh i just can't make the lifestyle and then you look at lucy mays now and they are so committed and they have all this time they're putting into it and they're she's working you know eight ten twelve hours a day six seven days a week and it's just like that and it's just and now we're kind of at the point that we're taking a little bit more time off and doing things and we see them 
not struggling, just working wanting to really hard. Working, working to get to hard, their yeah. their financial piece mm-hmm. where they want to be at, and mm-hmm. they're in the reverse zone as we are now. And um, it, it's interesting to be able to see that because we were in that grind for so long, as well as you guys were. We were all in that grind of building, 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 and getting to where you're at now. And then you're like, oh man, it, it, I don't know if I want if I ever want to grind that hard again because that was. That, I mean, I, I think that took time off our our our, our internal time clock. You know, and I mean, that really putting those 18 or 20 hours a day running a snowplow company and then running a, a 24 hour limousine company at the time and doing all the other things that we did too. It's just like, you know, it was just insane. And when you look at people That's that hard. are not working the nine to five job and they work five days a week and that is a tough week sometimes for them. Um, you know, some people just don't want to be in those positions and, mm-hmm. and that doesn't make any wrong. Some of them have very great family lives and they have this all this family time and they're doing all these things and they value the, something different. Value, and, yeah, that's where I'm getting to. It's is, not wrong. It's just no, different. And, and that is okay. But I love the fact that there's going to be somebody to teach it. I started teaching how to open a small business to the high school students because I was like, You know, if somebody had come alongside me when I started and said, let me give you some of the steps of how to get there. Also, I would just want to encourage you. And I don't know what made me, I think because you went first. And so I was like, well, I'll do it too. And, but it was terrifying. I had an employee currently that works for me and he said, what's the hardest thing for you about owning a business? And I said, fear. Fear was the hardest thing. I was so afraid that I was going to fail that I was I, it re- I really struggled to just even start, and um, I'm glad that I did. And uh, failure is such a good thing. I have had a, I have had a real like job failure. in like that's what I'm saying. Almost it's, thirty it's years now. It's, it's <laughs> a, I remember when you it's opened a, the cleaning company. It's yeah, a series of unintended outcomes, and, I know. And, and that you can shift on. It's not this like failure. You can't change your mind. You can't recover. It's just oh well that that wasn't good. Let's do it. Over, let's do it this way now. Yeah, so we're going to do something else. Zones. We're yeah. just stepping to where we want to get to now. And and our business career life now, our main business is just another stepping stone for the next place we want to get to. And mm-hmm. in the next place we might want to get to, maybe it's just real estate, or maybe it's retirement and and being done with all of it. I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. it's all it, it's all just you'll never relative. be done. It's, you know, oh, you yeah, I don't that. ever really want to be done. Wait, what is done? I just so want, you have to yeah. defend what done is. Yeah. Is it done because we're not running a, a restaurant 100% of the time now? Or is mm-hmm. it we're done that we're just running our real estate portfolio now? Is I, it done that we're, we're we're buying and investing or loaning money? I mean, But when you're that? an entrepreneur, it's you, you. if you're a true entrepreneur, you're constantly thinking of the next thing. I could take that and I could make money with this or I could build a system out of that and or whatever the case and I could put five people to work doing that and it's your brain doesn't shut off it's not something that you're just like okay I'm I'm going to retire from that it's it's you're you it's bred into you that's that's it's a curse sometimes because well, I am constantly thinking about the next thing that I have to go do or get to do it's exciting but I don't you're, think it'll ever show You're a off. dreamer and you'll never stop being a dreamer. You may get tired and not be able to do what you used to do, like building, he's building another kitchen that made me laugh. I just thought about that. You're building another kitchen. Yeah. Because uh, we're, we're transitioning the, uh, the Jimmy Bear business into our shop and building a wholesale kitchen. So he's no longer using our wholesale kitchen. He'll use, um, and it will be specifically designated just for Jimmy Bears. And I laughed when I thought about it when I was in the, garage yesterday and I yeah. I just thought yep so what well, is that six kitchens now that you will have built something like but they're down yeah. pat now it's not like your first one you already no, know he knows what yeah. to do he knows all yeah. the regulations now it's you easy. get there yeah. Yeah. But it just makes me laugh the fulfillment that you get in doing the task can be shifted to helping others mm-hmm. they have complex problems for them that you have answers to and I think that that's probably that's part of what the raise up podcast is is it's not just about um like talking about what we're what we've got going on in our business it's it's giving people information like oh i'm not the only one who struggles with fear and i just need to per- push through mm-hmm. or i'm not the only one who has an issue with this situation going on or hey look at them like i'm normal and then also like having an opportunity to like present questions mm-hmm. and to understand like mm-hmm. hey i have a specific question that honestly 
a lot of these situations relate unilaterally across businesses mm -hmm. and that's really you're still solving problems some of them are complex but then you're you're sharing what you've learned to allow someone else to bloom and to raise up into their next space and i think Absolutely. that's really that's the significance of not just holding on to the knowledge it's sharing it and having this collective like mm -hmm. encouragement as you guys are doing now and that's yeah. what i think that's where i think you'll go is you'll be tired of buying fire He's trucks already there and i've already sold all my fire trucks i, I sold so i, I, was I sold so like proud 40 of you when I heard no that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is i feel like if you're not teaching you're going to be um if you're not running a mentorship you're going to be i mean you and the both of you guys you guys have so much knowledge from taking a company many companies from nothing to amazing like I don't know, fortune, right? The, I, I'm not saying money, but I'm not saying fortune 500, but wherever you make, you guys might be. Five million. Well, that's where we're at. We're number 499.99. Remember when you I brought, made it. You remember, made it. I'll never forget the time that we came up. We made the top 100 companies, I think, in the United wow. States. And Athena goes, oh my God, that's not an accomplished. We're like number 87. I'm like, that's 100 companies in the United States. I mean, there's like 2,000 companies in San Francisco. You know, <laughs> I was pretty proud of that. And I was like, man, we made it. This like, they were measuring on it. revenue, though. Mm -hmm. and um, They were measuring revenue and vehicles. <laughs> and that's not a, a real measurement tool because you can own a lot of stuff. I don't know. You're on the list. We we're on the list. You exactly. made the list. You know, the doctor's a doctor. Yeah. You got 89. Trophy on the wall. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Well, we appreciate you guys coming and joining us and like sharing some of the things that you have going on and some of these pieces of wisdom that will very likely like help someone else. That's, that's the just call. listening. And yeah. you guys have podcasts coming up too. We yep. want to really so support can, that. So where can they, where can they find you? Lined you guys up in the podcast areas? Where can they find you? Uh, well, we'll have to send you a link on it because we, and then yeah. we'll we'll add this link to it, and yep, then we'll, we'll get it, it there and podcast. start to get so, your guys' podcast so going. There you heard it, you guys. You will see a link on the bottom if you um, listen to the podcast and you want to learn more about Kimberly and Bill and what they've going on with their entrepreneurial teaching. And uh, we just appreciate you guys for coming, and thank you all for watching. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube page or check us out at raiseupmindset.com. So. See you next time. Episode 19. Yeah. <laughs> you were right. <laughs>